Happy Halloween, history buffs! My name is Nick Hodges, and today we'll be diving into the world of the Salem Witch Trials with a look at The Crucible. Now, before I start, it's important to note that The Crucible is based on a play written by Arthur Miller in 1953, and Arthur Miller also wrote the 1996 film screenplay. So a lot of what was put into the play and the film was either pure fiction or a dramatic interpretation of what really happened. Here's the premise. Salem in early 1692 was in shambles. The Puritans, who settled in what would later become Massachusetts, were in trouble. They had wanted to create a deeply pious society where they could govern with an iron fist, but the harshness of their Puritan lifestyle was backfiring on them. It was more than just a handful of Puritan farmers trying to survive in a harsh new world. Salem was a well-populated, intensely political town, with factions that were divided over how they should run it and who should be in charge. The winter of 1692 was one of the coldest on record for the people of Salem, and it heightened tensions between neighbours and sparked fears about crop failures and starvation. And it didn't help that the local reverend gave terrifying sermons about eternal damnation. So when young girls started falling ill, they believed that they were the targets of witchcraft. They thought the devil had come to Salem. The Salem trials were more than just the hysterics associated with witch hunts. They were manifestations of the politics of a strict and factionalized society. By the time the witch trials were over in May 1693, almost a year and a half after they began, over 170 people were accused of practicing witchcraft in Salem. 30 were found guilty, 19 were hanged, one man was pressed to death, and another five died while waiting in jail. But what led to this madness, and how much of the Crucible is an accurate portrayal of real history? Was there really something spooky going on in Salem? Or was it just Puritan politics or mass hysteria? Well, join me in this review as we separate facts from fiction to get a clear picture of what really happened during the Salem Witch Trials. This is The Crucible. Now before we dive into the witch trials, we need to get a better sense of who the Puritans were and why they ended up in New England. The Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century brought about massive societal changes in Europe. Catholicism, the predominant Christian faith, was now challenged by Protestantism, and bloody wars broke out over which religion should be practiced. In England, King Henry VIII broke away from Catholicism when he was denied an annulment from his wife, Catherine of Aragon. England would instead follow Anglicanism, also known as the Church of England. During this shakeup, another sect of Protestantism formed. Though the Church of England had done a lot to remove the ritual and ceremony that was so key to Catholicism, there were some that believed that not even these reforms had gone far enough. The Puritans believed in a church based only on scripture. No images, no ceremonies, nothing that would distract from following what they believed was a good, pure, and moral life. They believed that man was inherently sinful, so salvation was based on having a personal covenant with God. But just in case, they also believed that the government should help enforce these morals by punishing behaviors that didn't follow their strict lifestyle. However, these fun sponges weren't able to live this kind of life in England, as its laws were comparatively more tolerant to other faiths than they were. Dissatisfied, they sought out a new home where they could create and live in a Puritan theocracy. That place was Massachusetts. The Puritans found founded Salem in 1626 and the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1628, centered around what would later become Boston. From there, Puritan settlements started to spread throughout New England, but only 66 years after it was founded, Salem would conduct its now infamous witch hunts. But before I continue further, I'd like to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Curiosity Stream. It's a subscription streaming service that has nothing on it but thousands of hours of high quality documentaries, much of it original content that you can't find anywhere else. There's something for everyone from science, music, nature, art, even history. One of my personal favorites are the Apocalypse series covering the First and Second World Wars. Aside from using rare and colorized archival footage, they also cover the battles, their technologies, and the human cost of each conflict with gripping storytelling, narrated by the personal testimonies of the civilians and soldiers who witnessed these turbulent times with their own eyes. With new content being released on CuriosityStream each week, all of this and more is available, even if you're on a tight budget. However, if you click on the link in the description box below and type in the promo code BUFFS, you'll be able to save 25% off your annual plan today. And with that, let's get back to the review. 
Now, Salem was not the only place that feared witches. The earliest hunts in Europe took place in the mid-15th century. Women who didn't fit into normal society were targeted as witches. Single women, widows, and those living on the fringes of what was considered normal behavior. Between 1500 and 1660, an estimated 80,000 suspected witches were hanged or burnt at the stake in Europe. Witches were seen as men and women who joined with the devil, casting black magic spells and filled with lust. Basically the opposite of what a good moral Christian life preached. Now initially, Salem was a prosperous settlement. They built a strong economy selling salted cod and raw materials like lumber to English merchants. They built a government based on puritanical values, helping them to realize their dream of a Puritan theocracy. But over time, things started to unravel. In 1675, King Philip's War, also known as the First Indian War, broke out between the Wampanoag American Indians and the colonists. Though it lasted a little more than a year, several hundred colonists died. Thousands of American Indians were killed or sold into slavery, settlements were damaged or burned to the ground, and the people were left unsettled. There was a constant threat of war that lingered in settlements like Salem, so close to the edges of the northern frontier. But there were also big political changes the Puritans had to deal with. In 1686, King James II essentially turned all of New England into a super colony, run by by the crown. Suddenly, all the charters that governed the New World colonies were called into question. As James II was also a Catholic king, this brought back old religious tensions between Catholics and Protestants. In 1688, James's Protestant daughter Mary II and her husband, William of Orange, took control of England during the Glorious Revolution. And though it was a victory for Protestantism in England, it meant changes for the New World colonies. All of the governors and political structures were replaced. All of this political instability made it difficult for New World colonies colonies to govern properly. At the same time the Glorious Revolution was going on in England, King William's War, or the Second Indian War, was happening in the New World colonies. It was a fight of a land between the French and English, and their respective American Indian allies. That conflict lasted through the years of the Salem Witch Trials, and ended in 1697. And as if the constant threat of war and political uncertainty wasn't enough stress, things more locally in Salem weren't going well either. Factionalism was breaking the town apart. Literally, Salem was divided divided in two, Salem Town, which was close to the coast and focused primarily on merchant trading, and Salem Village, today's Danvers, which was slightly more inland and focused on farming. The two fought often about nearly everything, like who should be Salem's minister. They went through ministers quickly, and Salem became notorious for being a difficult place to preach. It was often the Salem Townies, the coastal elite, who controlled the wealth and leadership positions since they benefited from coastal merchants' trade. This, of course, made the rural Salem villagers resentful, and over time, newer Puritan generations born in Salem became less devout, and church membership dropped. Some, like the more inland Salem villagers, saw the increased wealth from merchant trading as evidence of straying further away from their puritanical beliefs. For them, all the things that were going wrong, wars with the indigenous, cold winters, and the political changes in England, were just proof that God was angry with them for not being as devout as they once were. Salem had become a hotbed of tensions. Older generations of Puritans were upset that newer ones weren't as zealous in their faith. Factions over the future of Salem were pitting neighbor against neighbor, and they argued constantly. Then, in 1689, a new minister was brought into Salem, Reverend Samuel Paris. He was a Harvard-trained theologian, though he didn't graduate, and had experience working on his father's sugar plantation in Barbados. When the plantation was destroyed in a hurricane, Paris decided to put his ministerial training into practice and moved to Boston. Though Salem had a bad reputation for going through ministers quickly, Paris saw an opportunity. He was adamant that he could bring Salem back to the puritanical values on which it was founded. His approach was to use fear. To scare the people back into being pious Puritans, Paris gave intense and inflammatory sermons. Your classic fire and brimstone, you're going to burn in hell type stuff. But it didn't help heal Salem. It led to more factionalism. There were those who wanted to keep Reverend Paris because he represented a return to the traditional farm-centric good old days of Puritan life in New England. And then there were those who wanted him out because he stood in the way of progress and represented nothing but a harsh, strict Puritanical life. The anti-Paris faction also believed he was only there for the money, as Paris constantly complained about his salary and what was owed to him. Paris, in return, only grew harsher, more divisive, and stricter with his congregation. 
His sermons became angry outbursts at those who wanted him gone, accusing them of dealing with the devil. So with all of this going on, you can imagine that things were really tense in Salem, both the village and the town, and the people had no real outlet to vent their frustrations and fears. And then, in January 1692, the Reverend Paris's nine-year-old daughter Betty and 11-year-old niece Abigail fell to the ground convulsing. Rumors started to spread that witchcraft was responsible for their condition. It was something everyone feared, that the devil had come to Salem. So this is where the movie begins. It starts with the girls of Salem running into the woods in the middle of the night to meet with Tichiba, Reverend Paris's slave. The girls dance around, casting small objects like flowers and frogs into a pot, and ask Tichiba to cast love spells on various boys in town. Now, Tichiba in both the film and in real life was an important figure in the witch trials because she was the first to admit to practicing witchcraft. But unfortunately, we don't have records of Tichiba before or after a time in Salem, so we don't know much about her. But over the years, historians and writers have made a lot of assumptions about her because she was a slave from Barbados, where Reverend Paris worked at his father's sugar plantation before taking the job in Salem. So in many interpretations of the witch trials in both print and film, Tichuba is portrayed as a black Barbadian woman, a clear outsider in Salem. This helps support the narrative so often found in tales of witch hunts that the outsiders are targeted and accused of being witches because they are different. A slave woman from Barbados clearly stands out from the Puritans and would therefore be an easy target. We know that Tichuba in judicial records was listed as a slave originating from the West Indies, but we also know that she was labelled as an Indian woman by her Salem peers. This is corroborated in a lot of contemporary sources living in the village at the time. So Tichiba in the historical record was clearly listed as being an Indian woman and not black, but it's also possible that she was both to be honest given how racially diverse the Caribbean is. I just find it interesting that all modern interpretations of Tichiba look similar to what we see in the movie. But regardless, this whole scene is just wrong. There is no evidence that the girls did witchcraft with Tichiba, threw charms into a boiling cauldron, drank chicken blood, or danced naked in the woods like Greek nymphs. Unfortunately, this is going to be a common theme. Arthur Miller took the real story and changed so much of it that it barely resembles history anymore. In reality, the witchcraft that started it all wasn't obviously this witchy with a bubbling cauldron and softly hushed spell. It really started in Reverend Paris's home, with Betty Paris and Abigail Williams playing around with fortune telling. Betty and Abigail wanted to know about their futures and who they would marry. They did a technique called the Venus Glass, where they filled a glass of water, grabbed an egg, and separated it over the cup. The idea was to watch the egg whites pool in the water, they would curl and swirl around, and whatever shape they took would tell them of their future. The girls reportedly saw the egg whites take the shape of a coffin. They freaked out, and then their symptoms began. Now, in the film and play, Abigail's portrayed completely differently than her real-life counterpart. In real life, Abigail was an 11-year-old child and was afflicted in the same way as her cousin Betty. But in the movie, she's a 17-year-old teenager clearly in love with a married farmer named John Proctor. Let's just get this one out of the way early, shall we? Abigail Williams had no relationship with John Proctor. At all. In any way. She was never a servant in their house, she wasn't in love with him, and they certainly didn't sleep together. Remember, she was 11. Abigail Williams was one of the girls who initially accused John Proctor of witchcraft, but she wasn't the only one. So the entire premise of this movie that Abigail Williams started this whole mess because she wanted to get back with John Proctor is just inaccurate. Anyway, back to the movie. So when Reverend Paris stumbles upon all the girls in the woods doing witchcraft, he's horrified by what he sees and breaks it up. Most of the girls, along with Tichiba, flee, but Betty freaks out and falls to the ground. As Abigail tries to get her up so they can run, Paris catches them. Back at the house, Paris is doing everything he can to figure out what's wrong with his daughter. But there's more at stake than his daughter's health. Now hear me, child. You must know that there is a faction in this church sworn to drive me from my pulpit. I know that, sir. And they will destroy me now if my own house turns out to be the center of some obscene practice. And this is where the movie, in my opinion, gets it right. Though it purposefully changed the story to center around a dramatic love affair gone wrong, Arthur Miller did a really good job in accurately portraying the factionalism that was splitting this community apart. Paris, who's supposed to be bringing strict puritanical values back to Salem, is in reality driving a wedge between his congregation. And to have witchcraft show up in his own house, that would undermine everything he's been working towards. His motivations throughout the film, and indeed in real life, operate on that fear. 
So Paris confronts Abigail about what he saw in the woods, and initially she just admits that they were dancing, nothing more. No mention of the very taboo stuff like drinking the blood of chickens. But Paris doesn't believe her and slaps her, violently. And this is another theme that's important to understand when considering what went wrong in Salem. The Puritans, though they professed to lead moral, pious lives, were intensely patriarchal. Young girls like Abigail were to be seen and not heard. While life for all Puritans was hard, it was arguably much harder for the women who were socially inferior to their male counterparts. Throughout the movie, we see girls being slapped around or beaten into submission in an effort to control them. And part of the reason why the girls took the witch trials accusation so far was that throughout the trials they had a measure of control over their lives and how they were seen by their neighbors. Suddenly, when they were pointing out witches in Salem, they had power and they relished it. The witch trials offered the girls a break from the strict gender and societal roles imposed on them. So in the next scene, the other girls who are dancing in the forest come to check on Betty and it's here that Abigail establishes an early dominance over the rest. All of you, we danced, that is all. And mark this, let anyone breathe a word or the edge of a word about the other things. And I will come to you in the black of some terrible night and I will bring with me a pointy reckoning that will shudder you. And you know I can do it. I saw Indians smash my dear parents' head on the pillow next to mine, and I have seen some reddish work done at night. I can make you wish you never saw the sun go down. Abigail at the end there is referencing the fact that her parents died during one of the Indian wars, so she's seen violence and has no problem replicating it. Her whole character is based on this. She's troubled, damaged, and seeking love, and she's willing to do a lot to get it, even using witchcraft to kill the wife of a one-time affair partner. The problem with this is that it's all speculation. We actually don't know much about Abigail before her time in the Paris household. We don't know what happened to her parents, and she disappears from the historical record after the witch trials end. So Arthur Miller here is just giving her some backstory and motivation. However, another girl's parents did die in front of her, Mercy Lewis. Pretty much her entire family was killed in both the first and second Indian Wars, and the orphaned Mercy Lewis ended up as a servant in Thomas Putnam's household. Putnam was a prominent man in Salem Village, and he was very pro-Reverend Paris. Mercy Lewis, like Abigail and Betty, was one of the afflicted girls, and she ended up accusing nine people of witchcraft and testifying in 16 different cases. So I'm not sure if Arthur Miller attempted to combine their backstories together, or just wanted to give Abigail a richer history, but there is no evidence to suggest that what we see in the film is correct. Shortly after this, Thomas and Anne Putnam come to visit Reverend Paris to see what's happening with the girls, because their daughter, Ruth, is also afflicted. And once again, there are lots of inaccuracies here. First of all, the Putnams didn't have a daughter named Ruth. The girl in the movie is supposed to be Anne Putnam Jr. She had the same name as her mother. I imagine Arthur Miller changed this to make it less complicated. Having two characters who are essential to the story with the same name would be confusing for an audience, so he just changed Anne Jr.'s name to Ruth. And second, the film shows us an unstable Anne Putnam because she's apparently lost so many of her babies. Goody Anne, we can only go to God for the cause of that. God! You think it'd be God's work that you have never lost a child or grandchild, Anna, and I bury all but one! She goes on to claim that the most pious woman in the village, Rebecca Nurse, who was apparently the midwife, killed her babies. And once again, basically everything about that is wrong. Ruth, who is really Anne Jr., was the eldest at 12 years old. Rebecca Nurse was not a midwife to Anne Putnam's children because Rebecca Nurse was a bedridden, frail 71-year-old. In real life, she was accused of witchcraft, brought into court, and later hanged to death. But she certainly wasn't the figure we see in Arthur Miller's version of events. The Putnams, however, were instrumental to the real story. So going back to factionalism for a moment, Thomas Putnam was a major figure in Salem. He was a Salem village man, and his family owned a significant amount of land. But when his father died, the elder Putnam left Thomas almost nothing. Instead, the bulk of the inheritance went to Thomas's half-brother, Joseph Putnam, who doesn't really feature in the play or movie at all. This unfortunately fueled a lot of tension between the two sides of the family, the Putnams of Salem Village and the Porter family, which is the family Joseph Putnam married into. 
and later Thomas Putnam would go on to accuse a lot of porters of witchcraft. In total, Thomas Putnam is responsible for accusing 43 people and his daughter Anne Junior accused 62 people. But why would Thomas Putnam and his family make so many accusations? Arthur Miller certainly didn't miss the chance to include this in his play. Mr. Putnam, we have an accusation by Mr. Corey against you. He states that you prompted your daughter to cry witchery upon George Jacob so that you might buy up his forfeited land. It is a lie. This man is killing his neighbors for their land. And that is absolutely true. The factionalism that was so rife in Salem was spilling into the witch trials. Because the government charter was changing so frequently, the Puritans in New England settlements often didn't know what the law was or how the system even functioned. Petty claims that would normally be settled in local courts often went unresolved, building resentment between neighbors. Terrifyingly, the witch trials became a way for neighbors to get back at each other. Angry at having been denied his inheritance, and on the side of the fiery Reverend Paris, Thomas Putnam used his wife, daughter, and servant to accuse his enemies. In fact, when we look at a map of where the accusers lived versus those they accused, it paints a pretty clear picture of what the Salem witch trials were really about. Shortly after we're introduced to the Putnams that we get our first look at the strange relationship between Abigail and John Proctor. The entire affair happened off screen, but Abigail is clearly still hung up on him. It was John's wife, Elizabeth Proctor, who caught them in the act and kicked Abigail out. And now Abigail wants Elizabeth dead, so she can have John all to herself. But John wants no part of this, as he's trying to live the life of a moral, Puritan man, free from sin. Child. How do you call me child? Wipe it out of mind, you must. You loved me then, and you do now. Abby, I may think of you softly from time to time but I will cut off my hand before I reach for you again. Abigail then forces herself on John and for a second he kisses her back, but then throws her to the side and gets into an argument with her. He essentially learns from Abigail here that the girls are all pretending to be afflicted to avoid getting into trouble for dancing in the woods and doing some harmless spells to get the town's boys to fall in love with them. Abigail, though, wasn't doing a harmless spell. She was actually trying to kill Elizabeth Proctor. That's why we see her kill that chicken and drink its blood. She was full on trying to make a deal with the devil. But again, none of this happened in real life. It's at this point that Reverend John Hale shows up. In both the film and in history, Reverend Hale was a Puritan minister who took part in the witch trials. He was initially in favor of the trials and is responsible for examining several of the accused. However, he later started having doubts about the witch hunts, especially once his own wife was accused of being a witch. Funny how that works. By the end, he opposed the trials altogether and wrote a book about the whole affair many years later. Anyway, once Hale arrives in the movie, he immediately starts looking for signs of witchcraft, and Abigail, the main instigator, pins the whole blame on Tichiba. She, she begged me, Concha. She begged me, Mecha. She lies. She sends a spirit into me in church. She makes me laugh at prayer. She have often laughed at prayer. She comes into me when I sleep. She makes me dream corruptions. Why is it but thing, Abby? Some nights I wake and I find myself standing naked in the open doorway without a stitch on my body. And she makes me do that, singing her damn Barbado song, tempting me. Now in real life, as you could probably guess by now, this is not how it happened. Remember that the real start to all this was when Betty and Abigail started showing signs of possession in January 1692 after a fortune-telling session. In February, Paris started to suspect witchcraft and Tichiba became an easy target because she is a woman on the margins of Puritan society. And it didn't help that another villager, Mary Sibley, asked Tichiba to perform a spell to find out if there were witches in Salem. In real life, Mary Sibley asked Tichiba to bake a cake using the urine of the afflicted girls, Betty and Abigail. Then Tichiba was told to feed the cake to the Sibley family dog. This was known as a witch cake, a form of white magic. The idea was that once the dog ate the magic cake, it would point to whether who the witch was that was tormenting the girls. Now there is a fine line here between what is considered white magic, like fortune telling and baking witch cakes, and black magic, like witchcraft and possession. Tichiba did as she was told, but the dog didn't point to anyone. In the end, the only thing the witch cake did was help fuel the rumors that witchcraft was responsible for 
Betty and Abigail's behaviours. Shortly after, more girls started acting afflicted. Tichiba becomes the main scapegoat and both Betty and Abigail accuse her of witchcraft. Then Anne Jr. accuses a woman named Sarah Good, and another afflicted girl, 17-year-old Elizabeth Hubbard, accuses a third named Sarah Osborne. Sarah Good was a poor, marginalised woman and was angry at the world for her misfortune. She received no inheritance from her family when her father died, and she was married off to a man with debts, and when he died, she was left behind to pay the bill. She depended heavily on handouts from neighbours for her continued survival, and they resented her for it. Even in the movie, she's shown to be a poor woman who looks and acts very differently from the rest of the community. Sarah Osborne too lived on the fringes of Puritan society. Her second marriage was to an Irish indentured immigrant who once worked for her, but the two married when he finished his servitude. The land she inherited from her first husband, Robert Prince, was meant to go to the couple's sons. Instead, Sarah Osborne kept it for her and her new husband. A very scandalous thing for a patriarchal society like Salem. And guess what? Her first husband was part of the Putnam extended family. There were lawsuits for years between the Putnams and Sarah Osborne over who rightfully owned the land. All three of the first women to be accused, Tichiba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne, were marginalized women who didn't fit into the Puritan status quo. Tichiba was an Indian slave, Sarah Good was a drunken beggar, and Sarah Osborne was scandalous. There's no wonder that they were the first to be accused of witchcraft. But of course it doesn't happen this way in the movie. In The Crucible, Tichiba is pressured by Reverend Hale, Reverend Paris, the Putnams, and now Abigail, the de facto ringleader of the afflicted girls. Paris then beats Tichiba, pressuring her to confess to alleged crimes. Eventually, Tichiba cracks and tells the room that she doesn't want to work for the devil, but she saw him and signed his book. Paris and Hale want more, so they lead her with questions about the other marginalized women, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, and eventually Tichiba confesses that she saw them standing next to the devil as well. Right on cue, Abigail and the other girls start freaking out and accusing other women in town, like Bridget Bishop, who was the first person to be hanged to death in Salem for being a witch. Off camera, we find out later that a bunch of other people in town have been rounded up and imprisoned for their alleged crimes. Now, while it didn't happen quite like this, the real Tichiba did confess to signing the Devil's Book, and that nine other people had as well, revealing a grand conspiracy of witches in Salem. As to why she did this? Well, as accurately depicted in the movie, she most likely cracked under all that pressure. But from that moment on, the accusations started flying around in Salem, including against Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter, who was arrested and thrown in jail with her mother. First, it was only the marginalized women, but as time went on, people were accusing anyone who crossed them. And the film does a really good job of showing just how out of control all these accusations were. There's a bit where an old man named George Jacobs waves at the Putnams from a distance. At that exact moment, a boy is putting kindling on a fire. When Mr. Jacobs lifts his cane in a gesture of hello, the fire whooshes to life. In the next scene, George Jacobs is on trial for witchcraft. Ruth Putnam, who again is supposed to be Anne Jr., tells the court that Mr. Jacobs flies through her windows at night, laying on top of her chest so she can't breathe. But Mr. Jacobs is an elderly man, and he attempts to calmly and logically explain why he couldn't possibly do what he's being accused of. Your Honor, I must have these sticks to walk with. How may I come through a window? But you could have sent out your spirit through a window, could you not? And therein lies the fallacy behind the trials that came after the waves upon waves of accusations. The courts were set up to believe everything the afflicted girls said, so those who were accused of witchcraft had no defense to save themselves from the noose, except to confess that they were witches. Now the film doesn't give us any dates, but the play tells us the courts take place in the spring. But there were two different hearings happening. First was the court of Oya and Termina, and then the trials themselves, which were conducted later in June of 1692. The court of Oya and Termina, which means to hear and determine, comes from English law, and was used to settle disputes in Salem because of all the political instability. Since William of Orange and Mary II came to power in England during the Glorious Revolution in 1688, there weren't any proper legal or government systems controlling the New World colonies. A man named William Phipps was installed as the Massachusetts governor, but he was too busy dealing with the Indian War to pay attention to these witchcraft accusations coming out of Salem. So he appointed another man to 
leads the court of Oya and Termina, Lieutenant Governor William Stoughton. Now, in the movie, trials happen both on and off screen, and they're so biased in favour of the girls that there's a 100% conviction rate. But when it came to the real trials, how could the courts be so sure these people were guilty? I mean, just because the girls are acting afflicted, screaming, writhing around on the floor, surely there can't possibly be enough evidence to convict someone. Well, if the judges were following English law like they were supposed to, then they would have needed either a confession or two witnesses to the same event to convict someone. What they're doing here would have been completely out of bounds back in England. Instead, these judges relied on something else that Arthur Miller hints at, but never properly names, and is crucial to the whole story, the evidence used to convict people of witchcraft in Salem. It was called spectral evidence. Now, spectral evidence was when a witness testified that the accused person's spirit came to them in the night and tormented them. Like Ruth Putnam saying, Mr. Jacobs flew through the window and crushed her chest. But how do you even prove something like that? I mean, the afflicted just claimed that another person's spectre was haunting them, and the court believed them. In the movie, a magistrate named Thomas Danforth, who ends up being the main judge, muses on this. Consider now, in an ordinary crime, Witnesses are called to prove guilt or innocence, but witchcraft is an invisible crime. Therefore, who may witness it? The witch, of course, and the victim. Now, we cannot expect the witch to accuse herself, can we? Therefore, we may only rely upon her victims, and the children certainly testify. It's important to clarify here because Arthur Miller conflated the court of Oya and Termina with the witch trials that Danforth was not involved in the earlier hearings. He was only present during the trials that started in June. In fact, Arthur Miller gets this character completely wrong. In real life, Danforth was more critical during the trials. It seems like Miller is combining Danforth's character with the real life William Stoughton, who was put in charge of the Oya and Termina hearings. Anyway, there's another thing that Arthur Miller doesn't expand on, which could have made for some really juicy content. And that's the absurdity of the physical evidence they accepted during the hearings. At one point in the movie, we get this line of dialogue. As a sure sign of witchcraft afloat. No, no, Mr. Putnam, we must not look to superstition in this. The marks of the devil are as definite as stone. The marks of the devil, exactly. The Devil's Mark, also known as a witch's teat, was thought to be what was left behind when the witches um, fed the devil. And this is what was found on the first woman hanged, Bridget Bishop. She was forced to strip in front of nine women and a surgeon, and they looked for any physical evidence of the Devil's Mark. And they found one. It was probably just a boil, but when you're adamant about proving the defendant is a witch, and you find a big red bump, that's apparently enough for a conviction. And then you add in some spectral evidence with one of the villagers claiming they saw Bridget's spirit haunting them, and boom, guilty. The physical evidence could also be taken a step further with the touch test. If the afflicted girl touched the witch she claimed was tormenting her, and the affliction stopped, then that was proof of witchcraft. As you can see, all this bullshit puts all the power in the hands of the girls. They could easily fake this. And the film does a really good job showing that through Abigail, who wants John Proctor all to herself, and is willing to see other people hanged to get what she wants. But just like in real life, not everyone in the movie is so easily convinced that the girls are being truthful. One of the other trial judges, Samuel Sewell, points this out to Danforth. Samuel, I believe you are sometimes not entirely content with us. Am I correct? I must tell you, Thomas, I had not expected so much of our evidence to come from children. And you? I had not. But you cannot doubt the children are painfully attacked. No, oh, I see that plainly. Recall the Gospel, Samuel. From the mouths of babes shall come the truth. I, I... Uh... But it is also this Putnam woman. I wonder if losing her children has not distracted her mind. And Mr. Putnam, I learn he's in constant disputation with his neighbors over his boundaries. And then there are some who tell me he's not honest. Then there's John Proctor, who also doesn't believe any of this nonsense. He knows Abigail and what she's capable of. So when his wife, Elizabeth Proctor, is accused of being a witch and the local jailers come to take her away, he loses his call with Reverend Hale, who is currently still in favor of the trials. You are a broken minister. I promise you, if she is innocent... If she is innocent? Why does never wonder if Paris be innocent or Putnam or Abigail? Are the accusers always holy now? Were they born this morning as pure as God's fingers? I'll tell you what's walking Salem vengeance. 
The little crazy children are jangling the keys of the kingdom and common vengeance rights. The Lord, I'll not give my wife to vengeance! But before long, John Proctor too is accused of witchcraft, and the accusation comes from his servant, Mary Warren. It all goes back to a scene where Mary Warren gives Elizabeth Proctor a poppet, which is a little doll she made in court to pass the time. The problem is that the Puritans associate poppets with witchcraft. When the jailers come for Elizabeth, they find this doll in the house. Mary tells them that she made it for Elizabeth, but it does no good. Abigail, up to her old tricks, knew that Mary made this doll and had left a pin in it for safekeeping. Abby stabs herself, stumbles into the tavern, and walks up to Danforth and the other judges and tells them that Elizabeth Proctor's spirit attacked her. The pin in the poppet was like a voodoo doll, and Abigail staged it to look like Elizabeth was trying to kill her with witchcraft. Why did Abigail do this? Well, just before this scene, John confronts Abby and essentially tells her that if Elizabeth is named and arrested, he'll come for her, and not in the way she wants. To get back at John, Abigail ramps up the story that Elizabeth's spirit is tormenting her, hastening her arrest. John Proctor, of course, is furious. He knows Abigail is lying about all of this, so he pressures his servant Mary Warren to tell the truth. Now, the whole puppet story is fiction, but in real life, John did force Mary to come clean. He did this by beating her until she snapped out of her delusions, and apparently this worked because she miraculously stopped having fits and admitted she lied. Then John forced her to face the court and tell them that it was all fake. And just like we see in the movie, as soon as Mary Warren tries to tell the court the truth, Abigail and the others turn on her, acting as if Mary's spirit was attacking them. Mary eventually caves because she fears being ostracized by the other girls, and it certainly doesn't help when Danforth says things like this. Now it may be that Satan has conquered Mary and sent her here today to distract our sacred purpose. If so, her neck will break for it. But if she speak true, I bid you all confess your pretense now. Fearing retribution from the girls and potentially being hanged to death for telling the truth, she rejoins the girls in their pantomime and then goes on to accuse John Proctor of being a witch. Now, it doesn't happen exactly like it's shown in the movie, but the basic facts are there. John Proctor is arrested and thrown in jail. We are then shown, both in the movie and in real life, that there is really only one way for the accused to save themselves. Infuriatingly, it's by confessing to being a witch. Oh, Mr. Jacobs will hang! Hi. I am Goody Osborne, too. The deputy governor will permit it? He must. But not Sarah Good. She will only sit in jail some time for Sarah Good confessed, you see? It really makes no sense. If you maintain your innocence, you'll be hanged as a witch because spectral evidence or some other such bullshit condemns you. But if you confess and say that you're a witch, you won't be hanged. Instead, you'll just sit in jail for a while. The ridiculousness of all of this reminds me of that scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We have found the witch! May we burn her? Burn her! She is a witch. She looks like one. Yeah, she looks like one. The only difference is that in Salem, the witches weren't burnt. They were hanged. Except for one named Giles Corey, who was pressed to death for refusing to enter a plea when accused of witchcraft. He saw right through the hypocrisy and refused to play their game on a matter of principle, thus exposing how this kangaroo court was behaving well beyond the limits of the law, as they were. For example, to get their coveted confessions from suspected witches, they even turned to torture, which would have been completely illegal back in England. Anyway, near the end of the movie, we see John Proctor in jail. Hale has all of a sudden changed his mind and all this madness and quits the court. He doesn't want to be responsible for any more deaths as he was part of the group that examined the accused witches and condemned them to die. Paris too has changed his tune. He spent the whole movie railing against the accused and being such a divisive figure, but now realizes that the whole town has finally turned against him for all the trouble he's caused. At one point, a knife is thrown at his door and he fears for his life. Since John Proctor is such a well-respected man in town, Hale and Paris try to get him to confess because if John Proctor dies, Paris fears what the town will do to him. Whereas Hale just feels guilty about his role in getting so many people arrested and killed. John's wife Elizabeth is even brought in to help convince him as well. The couple reconcile, she forgives him for his adultery, and he forgives himself. 
They're ready to confess to witchcraft, survive the ordeal, and try to move on with their lives. But then Danforth forces John Proctor to write his name on a pre-written confession, which will then be nailed to the church door. And then we get some absolutely classic Daniel Day-Lewis acting. My, my name I cannot sign. Why? Do you mean to deny this confession when you are free? I mean to deny nothing. Then explain to me why you will because not- Because it is my name! Because I cannot have another in my life! Because I lie and sign myself to lies! Because I am not worth the dust on the feet of them you have hanged. I have given you my soul. Leave me my name! Though he signed the paper, John Proctor rips up the confession, refusing to be a part of the charade any longer. He accepts his fate and decides to be hanged as an innocent man rather than lie to stay alive. He, the pious Rebecca Nurse, and Martha Corey are all brought to the gallows, where they recite the All Father prayer and are hanged to death. It's a powerful scene, but it's not accurate. The three were not hanged on the same day. Rebecca Nurse was part of the second set of hangings that took place on July 19th, 1692. And it's worth mentioning too that it was once Rebecca Nurse was hanged that the community started to shift their opinion on the trials. The first woman to die, Bridget Bishop, fit the bill of your typical witch. She was elderly, poor, difficult, and suspicious of others. But Rebecca Nurse? She was the most free from sin. She was more devout than anyone else in the village, and they all knew it. Want to guess who in real life accused Rebecca Nurse? That's right, the Putnams. Both the elder and younger Anne Putnam accused her of being a witch. So when she was hanged, all of a sudden made clear to everyone in Salem that no one was safe. John Proctor was then hanged a month later on August 19, 1692, and Martha Corey on September 22nd. When the real Salem witch trials finally did end in mid-1693, it was only after it started to affect the elite, when Governor Phipps' wife was accused. Enough was enough. Phipps came down hard on the trials and the judges who let this lunacy go on for as long as it did. The last hanged witches were part of Martha Corey's group on September 22nd, although a few more died tragically in jail after that. Those who were accused of witchcraft but were either still in jail awaiting their fate or had confessed were released upon payment of a jail fee. How outrageous is that? And that's how the Salem witch trials ended. For an adaptation, The Crucible isn't exactly historically accurate, but Arthur Miller would be the first to admit that. So what was his real objective when writing it? To understand his writing choices, we need to consider the context in which Arthur Miller wrote it. What did the United States look like in 1953? Well, it was at the height of the Red Scare, McCarthyism. The threat of communism from the Soviet Union and China spreading to the US was a very real fear, and Arthur Miller had to live through the worst of the Hollywood blacklists. A time when people in the entertainment industry, writers, movie stars, playwrights, were scrutinized for their political beliefs, and if they were deemed communist or even remotely sympathetic to communism, they would be blacklisted from Hollywood, their careers would be over. They could be brought before the House Un-American Activities Committee, called HUAC, and investigated. It was hysteria, propelled by a fear of the unknown, groupthink, divisive figures, and false accusations. Many lives were turned upside down. Sound familiar? In an article published in June of 2000 titled, Are You Now or Were You Ever?, Arthur Miller wrote this. It would probably have never occurred to me to write a play about the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 had I not seen some astonishing correspondences with that calamity in the America of the late 40s and early 50s. My basic need was to respond to a phenomenon which, with only small exaggeration, one could say paralyzed a whole generation. I refer to the anti-communist rage that threatened to reach hysterical proportions, and sometimes did. A similar paralysis descended on Salem. In both places, to keep social unity intact, the authority of leaders had to be hardened, and words of skepticism towards them constricted. Words had gotten fearsome. For those of you history buffs who wanted a historically accurate movie about the Salem witch trials, The Crucible is not it. But what it does get right is authentically portraying that fear of speaking your mind when all those around you have been deluded by a social contagion. To criticize or question it means putting your own life at risk. 
that fear of watching divisive figures take advantage of the chaos for their own benefit. Instead of a history about how the Puritans tore their own community apart, we get a story of Abigail Williams's vengeance after she was rejected by John Proctor, and how she led a whole gang of girls against the patriarchal systems that oppressed her. In doing so, she destroyed her village and was responsible for the deaths of many innocent people. At the end of the movie, once Salem catches on to what was really happening, Abigail steals her uncle's money and disappears on a boat to Boston. Which probably didn't happen in real life, though we don't know what happened to Abigail after this whole ordeal, because she never appears again in any historical record. And finally, one last question remains. Did any of the girls really believe they had been afflicted by witches and evil magic? Well, here's what happened when a few of the girls were taken out of Salem towards the end of the witch trials to see if they could find witches elsewhere. One day while on the road to Ipswich, they observed a woman and fell into convulsions. However, instead of turning on the woman, the passers-by merely stared or hurried past. The afflicted girls quickly gathered themselves together and continued on their way. Then, years later, in 1706, well after the witch trials ended, Anne Putnam Jr. gave a public church confession, admitting she falsely accused Rebecca Nurse and others of witchcraft, and begged for forgiveness. Although the Crucible gets a lot of Salem's history wrong for the sake of quality drama, it does stand as a testament to the dangers of groupthink and social contagions, dangers that still follow us today. More than any witches, ghouls, or goblins ever could, it is this that scares me the most. What's sometimes referred to as mass hysteria, or a moral panic, or uh, a mass psychosis, is this idea that we start with someone who says, I see this, or I've experienced this. With Salem, potentially what happened is that the first person was someone who was traumatized, where they had a much more elaborate reaction than we might expect. And now that person might be someone who is traumatized, for example, and has a weird PTSD symptom. And this then is seen by other people who go, oh, maybe I see that too, maybe I experience that as well. What you might find is these women looking at patient zero going, oh, this is maybe an option for me to get in with the in-group, to get this kind of attention, to get to be heard, basically. Teenagers might be particularly prone to these kinds of social contagion effects because we know that teenagers, are, they're trying to find their way, they're trying to fit in, they're trying to navigate social norms and culture and how we think we're expected to behave and they're more suggestible. So that combination makes young people much more likely to buy into these completely erroneous and potentially really harmful ideas. Well, that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. If you wish to support History Buffs, then you can now do so at Patreon. And as always, let me know in the comments section what you thought about The Crucible. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? In the meantime, check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook pages for new updates. Until then, I'll see you next time.